Stanford University. All right, well, welcome to Stanford CS193P, developing applications for iOS winter of 2017. This is lecture number nine. And today we have only one topic, which is table view. And I'm gonna go through a bunch of slides to talk about it, the concepts of it. And then we're gonna have a humongous demo that uh, we're gonna build a Twitter client and it's gonna use table view uh, and some other things that we've learned like text field. And a table view, what is it? You've seen a table view in all sorts of iOS apps. It's just this uh, UI where there's a list of things. There's really two different kinds of looks to table view. There's the kind on the left there, which we call plain style. Plain style is just a list of things. And it might be collected into groups, like little sections, but it's mostly just a big long list. On the right side, it's called the grouped style where the sections uh, in the table view are more obviously uh, disconnected from each other. They have, you know, big gaps in between. Um, normally, the uh, plain style we use for dynamic data, okay, data that might have any number of items in there. The group style we tend to use for static data, where we know exactly what rows are going to be in there and exactly what's going to be in them, okay? So let's talk about the names of all the parts of a table view so that as I'm explaining all this, you'll know what the terminology is. Um, first, we have the table header. Header That's a UI view. It's, there's only one of them. It sits at the very top of the table. This is where, as you'll see in the demo, you might put a uh, search field or something that searches to find what's in your table or something like that. And similarly, there's a footer view. Rarely see this used, but it's just a UI view that sits at the bottom of the table. And in between, there are these things called sections. So a section is just a combination of a header and a footer, which are usually strings, but also could be UI views, and then any number of rows, okay? That's what we call a section. So that's a section right there. This is a section header for the two sections that I have in this, showing in this table, right, where it says header zero. And these are the section footers for the two sections that I have. These two sections happen to both have the same number of rows in each, which is two, but a section, one section could have 100 rows and one could have just one. It's perfectly uh, fine. This right in here, we call a table cell, C-E-L-L -L cell, and uh, it's a UI view. Actually, UI table view cell is the name of the UI view subclass that's in there. And this is the thing that's gonna draw the data that's at a particular row, and we're gonna see how that works. By the way, along the bottom, you're seeing source code that kind of corresponds with these things. Don't worry, I'm gonna get back to showing you all of that stuff in later slides. So this is the naming we use to name all the parts of a plane uh, or of a table view, and this is in plane style. All the same names uh, work in group style. Everything just kind of looks a little different. Right, still have a header, footer, sections, all, this, all the same, just a little different uh, UI look. Now, tables can have sections or not. You don't have to have any sections, so the table on the left is just a whole list of cities uh, and the countries they're in, and just a big long list. On the right, it's kind of the same kind of list, but you can see that they're grouped into sections there by country, right? So Japan there, Mexico, uh, et cetera. So uh, sections are optional, not optional in the case of an optional, but sections you can have them or not, it's totally up to you. The type of the cell, like each row, there are four kind of predefined types and then there's a custom type. The four predefined types are subtitle, where you just got like a title and a little smaller text subtitle under, under it. There's default, which is the same except for there's no little subtitle thing. There's value one and value two, which is just like subtitle, it's just that the little thing underneath is in a different spot. It's either blue and uh, to the left or it's kind of grayed off and to the right, but it's just how it's laying out the basic information there. Now, a custom cell can have arbitrary UI in it, as you will see. So how do we use a table view? Okay, this table view is a view, it's a UI view, it's actually a UI scroll view, a subclass UI scroll view, because it's scrolling through all those rows. So how do we do it? Well, 99% of the time, we use this special view controller called UI table view controller in UI kit. And the UI table view controller is just a convenient package to use UI table view in. And it's self.view is a UI table view, okay? So you would only use a UI table view controller when your entire self.view is going to be filled with a table view. 
And you can add one into your storyboard just by dragging it out as we always do. There's a thing called table view controller and it's going to drag it out. Now it's a controller, so when you drag it out it looks like an MVC, but inside of that MVC there's a table view sitting there. Okay? And so what, in what you see here, the controller is a UI table view controller and the self.view of it is a UI table view, okay, subclass of UI scroll view. Now, like any other view controller, if you're going to do anything with this thing, you need to subclass it, right? Just like you create a calculator view controller or a graph view controller, you need to subclass your UI table view controller as well. And you do it the same way, right? New file to create it. Uh, it's going to be a Cocoa Touch class, of course. Uh, it's going to be a subclass of UI table view controller. Make sure you pick that. Don't say it's a subclass of UI view controller. It has to be a, a subclass of UI table view controller if you want it uh, to work. And then you just set it in the identity inspector to be your class, just exactly like any other controller. It's just that it has to be a subclass of UI table view controller. Um, this UI table view controller subclass is also going to serve as the data source and delegate. Okay, the data source is a special kind of delegate for getting the data in the table uh, for the table view that's inside of it. So we're going to talk a lot more about that uh, down the road here. Uh, by the way, if you right click on the view controller and you get that black window to come up, you can actually see it. If you look down towards the bottom there, you see data source and delegate, their properties, and they're pre-wired up for you. If you use this UI table view controller thing, it just pre-wires it up that the controller is the delegate and data source of the table view. Um, if you don't use UI table view controller, by the way, this kind of pre-packaged one, then you'll have to wire up the data source and delegate, you know, either in code by saying what, you know, table view dot delegate equals self or something like that. Uh, you'll have to do it yourself. But 99% of the time you're just going to use this UI table view controller because usually the best UI for a table view is for it to take over the whole screen. Okay, for it to fill the whole screen. It's rare that you can have table view like in part of your screen. Okay, so uh, you can edit the attributes of the table view itself, of course, uh, by just clicking on it and bringing up the attributes inspector. One thing that's a little frustrating about a table view is you've got the table view cells, which are UI views, and then you've got the table view kind of that they're contained in, that's a UI view also, and then you've got the table view controller behind it, and you want to set attributes on all these things. So don't forget you can do control shift and left click and it'll put up a little menu that says, okay, what thing under the mouse do you want? Do you want the cell, the table view, or the controller? Okay, and so that'll help you dig, dig, dig down to the thing you want. All right, but once you have it selected, whatever, whichever one you want, like the table view or the controller or the cell, you can inspect it, of course. Now, one important thing is this grouped versus plain that I showed you at the very beginning. So here I'm gonna switch this one, which is plain, over to grouped. Okay, so I'm just picking grouped in the style there in the inspector. Another important attribute is dynamic versus static. So dynamic is all the contents are coming from some database, and static is I'm going to put all the content right here in the storyboard. Okay, so here we'll switch this one over to static. So this is now a static grouped um, uh, table view, and I told you that usually static table views are grouped, and usually only grouped ones are static, so usually these kind of go together. They don't have to, they're separate properties, but they uh, generally go together. Now, the UI for these rows, most of the time you're just going to build by dragging UI in. So here, I'm just dragging a label in here, and you know, maybe I'll change the name of the label, dragging a, a UI switch in there, because I want to set some setting. Uh, oftentimes, by the way, the things are, this thing is used for settings and things like that. And uh, then if I want to talk to these switches and t labels that I brought in there, I'm actually going to create outlets to my UI table view controller. And since this, what's in this table is fixed for all time in the storyboard, right? I'm building it in the storyboard. That's perfectly fine. So I would just control drag from them to my controller, which will work. And then I can create an outlet, for example, in my feature enabled switched outlet, and it'll create an outlet here. And then in my code in my controller, I can obviously do whatever I want to that switch. So it's almost like when you have a static table view, it's almost just like normal view that you would build UI in. It's just it's divided into these rows, which is nice for something like settings, right? If you think about the settings app, right, in your, on your phone, it's got a lot of UI that's kind of in rows, right, and in tables. So if you really want to see how static table view works, get your phone out, go to the general settings app, and just look around in there. That is table view after table view after table view where the rows are static, built in some storyboard somewhere, 
by Apple. Okay. All right. So uh, that's pretty much it for static table views. Are pretty straightforward to do. So I'm going to clear this UI out of here. This feature enabled out of there. And we're going to talk about a different kind of table view, which is dynamic. Okay. So a dynamic table view, you set it here by picking dynamic property prototypes rather there instead of static cells, uh, really is a totally different kind of animal. And I'm going to switch back to plain style because usually dynamic tables are plain style. These rows now, instead of being something you're going to, you know, build the UI and they're static, instead they're prototypes. They're things that are going to be copied for every row. So whatever UI you would build in one of these rows, and you can build custom UI like we saw with the static one, it's going to be copied for every single row. So these are prototypes. You see what I mean by a prototype? It's like a template that's going to be copied over and over and over um, to make your table. So it's a really different uh, kind of way of looking at things because this data that's going to go into these rows is coming from some database somewhere probably. And filling out all this information. So it's a little more complicated to build a table like this, but not a lot more. So you can click on any one of the cells and you can inspect it, right? The prototypes that you want. For example, you could change its type from being custom to being subtitle. All right, so here's what a subtitle cell looks like. Remember I showed you in the sec very second slide. It's one of the pre-canned types and it just has, you know, a text field and then like a little smaller text, text field. So that's a subtitle. You can also set with accessory there a little thing that can appear on the right. It could be a little check mark that you turn on and off. It could be a disclosure indicator, which you want to put there if clicking on this row is going to segue. Okay, that little disclosure indicator is just a little kind of gray arrow thing that lets the user know, hey, if I click on this row, it's going to segue. There's also kind of a special one called detail disclosure. And the detail disclosure looks like this. It's a little eye in a circle. And what's really cool about that is you can segue by clicking on the row, but if you click on the little blue eye, it does a different segue. Okay, so you kind of have your row doing two different segues depending on whether they touch on the little eye or touch somewhere else. You see the little gray arrow next to the eye? That's the disclosure indicator. So if I click on this row, it's going to segue. If I click on the little eye, it's going to do some different segue. Maybe bring up some, a modal panel with some information or something like that. Okay, we'll talk about how that works uh, in a second. All right, so I'm going to go back to non detail disclosure, get rid of that thing. Um, but another style besides the four pre-canned ones I talked about in the beginning of this lecture uh, that you can pick is custom. So custom means that there, that's just a UI view that you can build any UI you want. Again, similar to that feature enabled with the switch that I showed. But again, this UI is going to get copied over and over and over for every single row uh, in the table that you want to use this. Notice, by the way, there are multiple prototypes. That means you can have different set setups of UI that you could use for different rows. Okay. And we're going to name each of these prototypes so that in our code, we can pick which prototype we want for a certain row and it'll copy that prototype. Okay. Now, um, these custom cells, you can resize them. You can, um, drag stuff into them, build any UI you want. Here I've built this complicated UI with text fields and an image. This is very similar to UI that I'm going to build in the demo. All right. Now, when you, uh, build this UI, you're going to want to use proper auto layout. So stack views and hooking it to the edges, just like you did with the calculator or even stuff on the inside. I'll show you a little bit to that today, a little more auto layout, because if you do that, then the table view will be able to figure out the size this thing needs to be dynamically. Okay. If you don't do the right auto layout, then you kind of have to just fix the height of the rows. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute uh, as well. So you generally want to do auto layout properly in there if you can. Now, there's no way I could wire up these elements directly to my controller. Do you see why? Because there's only one outlet in my uh, controller for one of these labels, but there are hundreds of rows. So how is my one outlet going to, it can't be hooked up to 100 at once, okay? But I still need outlets because else how am I going to set these things, all right? And so the way we're going to deal with that is we're going to wire these things up to outlets in the, the UI table view cell, the UI view that contains them. Okay. So I told you that this cell is a UI view, UI table view cell, and the, it contains all of these things, these labels and stuff. So we're going to have outlets in that. Now, this is the first time you've ever seen outlets in anything but a controller. And pretty much this is the only other time you're going to have outlets. You can't have outlets in a regular view, but you can have outlets in these special table view uh, cells. 
All right, so let's see a little bit uh, how that works. So uh, one thing, if you're going to have outlets, you know you're going to need to have a subclass, right? Just like you have a controller, you can't use a, a generic UI view controller. You can't put any outlets in that. You have to subclass it so you can wire your outlets up. Same thing here. You're going to have to make a custom subclass, a UI table view cell. You do that with new file. Uh, it is still a Cocoa Touch class, but here you're going to choose UI Table View Cell as the superclass, not UI Table View Controller, UI Table View Cell. And again, UI Table View Cell is, is a subclass of UI View also, by the way. All right, so you're going to pick a UI Table View Cell, you call it something like My Table View Cell or whatever, and then you're going to do the exact same thing where you're going to have that cell selected and you're going to go to the Identity Inspector and you're going to change it from being a generic UI Table View Cell to being My Table View Cell. And this is going to allow you to create outlets in my table view cell to these things that are contained inside my table view cell. Okay, so now we can wire them up. So remember that static elements, the thing I showed you at the beginning, those are wired up to the controller. Dynamic elements, where we have these prototypes, those are wired up to the table view cell outlets. So what does it look like to wire them up? I'm going to have to do the same thing with a controller where I'm going to get the UI and the code on screen at the same time with the assistant editor. By the way, when you do that, if you're in automatic mode there, see where it says automatic, it's pointing at automatic, it's not going to bring up the table cell, the table view cell, even if you have the table view cell selected in the UI. It's still going to bring up the controller. Okay, so if you want to wire up outlets to a table view cell, you have to manually or forcibly get that table view cell, not the table view controller, table view cell on this side. So one way you can do it is by switching from automatic to manual and then navigating over to finding your table view cell dot swift class, right? And then choosing that. And now you're in manual mode. You've got the table view cell on the right and you've got your storyboard on the left. So now you can control drag, right? You just need to be able to control drag between them is the problem. So you've got to have them both on screen. All right. So then once I have them on screen, I control drag just absolutely normally, and it's going to do all the things that an outlet does. It's going to ask me, outlet or action, by the way, you can do outlet or action here. It's going to ask, so here I picked that photo, the blue thing, is, let's say it's a photo, and I'm calling this my photo image view, and it creates an outlet here. Okay, so that's great. Now this table view cell code can talk to that photo the image view, could for example set the image or whatever, but of course, it needs to know what information to put in that photo for that row, right? This, this thing's going to be repeated a hundred times, and each one needs to know what its row's photo is. So you're also going to need some public API on your table view cell, which gives it the data it needs to fill up all its outlets. Okay, so you're going to have some var, which I've called info shown by this cell. Okay, it could be of any type you want. And Somebody is going to set it. You'll see soon who sets it. And once it sets it, now we can update the UI and put all this information into the outlets. Okay, so this is how the information at each row in the table is going to be put into these UI elements. Y'all following me so far? Okay, all right. Let's talk about these two protocols, the data source and the delegate. Okay, they're critical to making UI table view work. UI table view is a class that literally cannot function without its data source and delegate. It's not really like split view controller where, eh, you don't have to do anything with the delegate if you don't want, it'll still work. This, you really have to do it, especially the data source. If you don't give it a data source, the only way a table view would work without its delegate and data source is if it were a purely static table, okay? Like the table that had the feature enabled with the switch. That you could deal without the data source. But otherwise, if it's providing dynamic data, obviously it needs the data and the only way it can get data is through its data source. So, as I already told you, UI Table View Controller automatically sets itself as its delegate and data source. So you can just put your code for these delegate methods right in your subclass of UI Table View Controller, right? Your My, UI table, my table View Controller or whatever. You can put it in there. Also, there's a cool var uh, in Table View Controller called Table View, which is basically going to return self.view, but as a UI Table View. And that way you can talk to the UI Table View that your UI Table View Controller is controlling. So when do we need to implement the data source? Anytime we have dynamic data, non-static. There are three really important methods in this protocol. One is how many sections are in my table? Could be one section if the whole thing is just a bunch of rows. How many sections? And then how many rows are in each section? You have, you're going to be asked one by one, how many rows in this section? How many rows in this section? How many are in this section? So it knows how many rows are in every section. And then most importantly, 
give me one of those UI table view cells to draw this row. Okay, so for each row that it wants to, that the table view wants to draw, it's going to ask you, okay, give me a UI table view cell now, because I'm going to draw this row. Okay, so that's how it works. That's the fundamentally how this works. Now, all these methods are in the UI table view data source protocol. So let's look at the last one, the give me a UI table view cell, because it's the most complicated. The other ones are super, super simple. So the way that you are going to give a UI table view cell back to the table view when it's time to draw a certain row is uh, by a method being called. Now, you might be worried here. It's like, whoa, I'm going to have this big UI with all these labels and image views in it. And I've, what if I have 100,000 rows? I'm going to make 100,000 views? Surely that's going to be terrible performance. And in fact, that would be terrible performance. Okay, Views are not cheap. Um, but it, no worries, because all your UI table view cells, these UI views that draw the rows, they're reused. So only the visible ones have UI table view cells. As you scroll around, the ones that scroll off the top get picked up and put around and used on the bottom. Okay? And the new data keeps getting pumped into them. Do you see what I'm saying? So those cells, only the, maybe the ones on the screen plus two or three on either side are actually getting created. They're, they're just getting reused. As you scroll up and down, they keep getting reused. So uh, now, the thing about that reuse, I want you to be very careful of. I put it in red. When I put it in red, you know that means wake up and watch out because of your homework. Uh, when you're doing multi-threaded things, you've got to be careful because by the time you come back from something you asked to do on another thread, your cell might be reused. <laughs> okay? And so you've got to be prepared for that. You've got to understand whether you're still the cell you thought you were when you sent something off to go in another thread. Okay? So I'm warning you. Okay, so what does this method look like that UI table view is going to send to its data source to say, give me a UI table view cell? It's called cell for row at index path. Okay, you see it right there? That's its signature. Uh, it really only has that one argument, index path. The index path is just a little container of the section and row. You could imagine this is even called cell for row at section and row, but it just puts them in one argument called an index path, okay? And then all you return is a UI table view cell, and it's going to use that UI table view cell to draw that row. So it really couldn't be a simpler API. It's at the heart of exactly what it's asking you to do. Now, what are you going to do inside this method? Well, first, you're going to have to get the data from your model that you want to show in that row, okay? And you can do this any way you want. I have a very convenient data structure here called my internal data structure that happens to be divided in sections and rows. So I can just index into it, but you might have a different uh, data structure, but you've got to take the section and row so that you know which row you're talking about and get the data out of your model. Maybe you're doing a database query. Maybe you're even doing a network query in another thread and it's going to return and fill this out, whatever. Uh, you need to figure out uh, how to get your data. Now, once you have your data, you're going to create a cell. I'm going to show you how to do that in a second. And then you're just going to load up that cell with the data. Okay, so let's talk about how we create that cell and load it up. So I'm going to take this little piece of code and I'm going to keep it on screen while I go back to showing you what's happening in the UI here. So first, let's talk about um, the a cell that's not a custom cell. It's just a regular cell like subtitle. You see subtitle up there? Okay, so uh, we're going to use this method here called DQ reusable cell with identifier for index path. And that's just going to return us a UI table view cell. Now again, this is a reused UI table view cell. Okay, it's been reused. Now if uh, this cell if there's not enough been created yet, then it will create one based on your prototype, whatever your prototype you pick in there. And you pick which prototype with this string, the identifier string, which you set in the inspector for the cell. Okay? So it's just in there, it's called identifier. You, this utilities inspector on the right is inspecting that cell, that top cell that says title, subtitle, it's inspecting that. And I'm just setting the identifier of my cell. So now in my code, when I say DQ reusable cell with identifier my cell, it's going to make a copy of that prototype. Unless there's some to be reused, then it'll just reuse them. But until it gets enough to reuse, it uses that prototype and just makes copies of it as necessary. Okay? Now, this is a non-custom cell. So the only, well, there's a few fields you can set. You can go look at the uh, API for UI table uh, view cell to find out. But to sell, send those two, set those two pieces of text, title and subtitle there, you just, you use text label.text and text and detail text label.text. 
Those are optional, so they could be nil. Because if there's a custom cell, for example, they might be nil. Uh, so anyway, that's it. You just set those. Those are just UI labels, and so you just set the text. It couldn't be easier, okay? And that's true for all the pre-canned ones. You're going to set these. You can. All, there is actually. I didn't show it, but there's an image also that you can set. A little image uh, in the cell, and that's also in the pre-canned one. So you could do that as well. Okay. So that's it. That's a simple. That's all you need to do to provide your data to the table view cell is just DQ one of these cells, load it up, and return it. And now the table view will use that to draw. But let's talk about a custom cell. So now I'm talking about the second row down, and look at its type. It's custom. It's not subtitle. It's custom. A little different for a custom cell. Okay? You're still going to do DQ reusable cell with identifier for index path, okay? but of course you're going to use a different identifier, because now I'm talking about the second cell down, which I'm calling my custom cell. Now here, you're not going to, there's no title and subtitle in that second row. Presumably there's that image and the thing under, text under it and text on the side, all the things, whatever, your UI switch, whatever you built in this custom cell. And you're, all that stuff has got outlets hooked up to the UI table view cell containing it. Remember all that that we did? So you need to just pass the data to that UI table view cell and it's responsible for loading up all the UI. Now how do you do that? First thing you need to do is take that DQ thing that came back, which is of type UI table view cell, and cast it with as to be of the type of your subclass of UI table view cell. Otherwise, you won't be able to call any of its API. Okay, so you're just going to do if I can let the cell equal the DQ thing as my table view cell, then I'm going to talk to my table view cell using its API and set, for example, info shown by this cell to be the data that's at that section in row. Okay? So to go back to the code I was telling before, that info shown by the cell is that bar right there. Okay? The bar that I made public in my table view cell. And then it's going to update UI and set all of its outlets and all that. Okay, so that's it. That's how it works. Those are the two cases, the kind of pre-canned ones and the custom one. They're almost identical. You're still DQing cell. You just set the data a little bit different. Okay. The data source uh, also has to know how many sections and rows. It's really simple. There's a method called number of sections in table view, and that's going to return int, how many sections there are. By the way, that one's optional. You don't have to implement that one. If you don't, it will assume there's one section, that all the rows are in just one big section. The other one, though, which is number of rows in section, where it passes you a section number and you have to say how many rows are in that section, that is not optional. That is mandatory, and you must answer this question for every single section that you claim that your table has with number of sections in table view, okay? So that's it. That's simple. It, it, why does it need to know how many rows and all the sections, by the way? Because it's a scroll view, and it needs to know how big a thing. It's, it needs to set its content size, basically, right? It needs to know how big a thing it's scrolling over. Um, so it needs to know all that. It also needs to know, you know, when to ask you for the data and all that. So it's pretty obvious it needs to know that. In a static table, by the way, it's not going to ask you these questions. So don't even worry about that. Okay, the static table is fixed in the storyboard, so it's never asking you for the data. So it's never going to ask you how many rows and sections and all that stuff there is. Okay, so the summary is... You set the table view's data source, that's automatic if you're using UI table view controller. You implement number of sections and number of rows, and then you implement cell for row at. And give back a table view cell, either a custom subclass if you're doing custom, or just setting the uh, detailed text label and the normal text label if you're not. Question. Okay, so the question is, what do I answer for that number of sections thing if over time my table view is growing? Right, maybe data is coming in from the network, or the user is clicking on things that makes more table happen. You can answer it that differently at any time. But what you're basically saying is, what if my model changes? I need my UI right to keep up with it. If my model gets bigger, then I need more rows. Well, you're going to see that it's really important to every time your model changes, you need to tell the table view about it, and you're going to tell it things like, "I've added a new section," and then it will come back and ask you all these questions again. All right, so that's how it works. Okay, it might come back and ask you these questions, including cell for row at, over and over and over as you tell it that you've changed your model. Because of course your model can change over time. Um, by the way, the titles of the sections, remember when I showed you the countries and it had Japan and Mexico as titles, those are considered part of the data. So those are part of the UI table view data source, source protocol as well. This method title for header or footer. 
uh, in section. And you pass the section number and it gives you the thing. You can also do it with a view using the delegate, uh, but if you want to just do it as a string, you can use the data source. Uh, there's a lot of other methods in the protocol. I'm not going to really talk about them. They have to do with things like deleting rows or rearranging the rows, things like that. Uh, if your model allows those things to happen, like things being deleted, then you're going to have to teach yourself this. Most of you will probably end up doing this for your final project. Okay, I'm not going to ask you to do it in the homework, but you'll probably do it for your final project. It's extra credit in the homework if you want to get a head start on that. All right, let's talk about segueing from a row. So I've got a row there. Okay, this one actually has a detailed disclosure in there as well. And I want to segue out of that thing. Uh, how do I do that? Okay, very simple. Uh, do it just like any, uh, like I was segueing from a button. I'm just going to control drag from the row to the MVC I want to segue to. And it's going to put up this black window. Now, this black window is a little different than other segues because you see it has two sections. Selection segue and accessory action. Okay, so the selection segue is if they click on the row and the accessory actions if they click on the little accessory button. Okay, but it's just a normal segue. Once you create the segue, um, you can click on it and inspect it. Uh, just like any other segue, you can set its identifier up there to something and then you're going to have prepare for segue. So here I've set the identifier to be ABC segue. So let's take a look at what prepare for segue looks like in, in, when you're doing this kind of segue. It looks almost exactly the same. Here I've got a prepare for segue. I notice that the sender there is any, and when you're segueing in a table view, what do you think that any is going to be? UI table view cell, okay? That view that contains the row. So that is going to be the sender when you are, just like a button is the sender, if you click on a button to segue, the row, the UI table view cell, is the sender in that case. Um, so the first thing you're going to want to do is convert the sender to a table view cell and sp specifically to your subclass of table view cell if you have a custom cell in case you want to do anything that's specific to your table view cell. If not, then you can just do it to UI table view cell. And then you want to get the index path of that cell so that you know what row where you're segueing from. Because every row, you can click on it, it will segue. So you need to know which row. And you do that by, with this very important method, index path for cell. And you can't pass any to that. You have to pass a UI table view cell or subclass thereof. So index path for cell. And that's going to give you one of those index path things. Remember, index path is just this little container with section and row. Uh, then you're going to get your segue to MVC, as usual. Okay. And you're going to set up, prepare your segued to uh, public API. And you're going to do it using the data in your model based on the section and row that was clicked on. Got it? So pretty easy segueing from it. Um, so yes, you can use your public API if you're segued to MVC. What about the table views delegate? We talked about the data source. What about the uh, table views delegate? It's got a kind of a miscellaneous bunch of stuff in there. but. Generally, the delegate is talking about how the table view is displayed, and the data source is what data is actually in the data, in the table. Okay, so that's the difference. So the delegate, we're talking um, about things, yeah, they're usually the same object. So the delegate uh, also has all the will, did, should things, okay, that you can watch what's happening in the table view. This row did get selected, things like that. For example, uh, here's table view target action. So if, when you click on a row, if you don't want to segue, but you just want to be target action, like a button, well, you can't really do that. You can't do target action because a row is not a UI button. But you can implement this delegate method, table view did select row at index path. And when someone touches on that row, this is going to get called. So it's just like target action. I told you uh, what happened. So now you can look at the index path row and section to know which row uh, was selected. So we call that uh, target action. You can do the same thing with that detailed disclosure, by the way. So if someone clicks on that detailed disclosure, you're going to get this method in your delegate called accessory button tapped for row with index path. Okay, so now you know which row that. So when things are clicked on, you can either segue or you can use these to find out things were clicked on and do whatever you want. Uh, so yeah, a lot of wills and dids and all those things. You can look at the, do at the documentation for UI table view delegate. Okay, now back to what this guy was asking before. What happens if my model changes? It gets bigger or even gets smaller or whatever. Um, one thing you can do that's kind of a hammer is 
reload data. If you call reload data on your table view, it's going to call all of your data source methods again. How many sections you got? How many rows in each section? Give me a cell for every single visible row. You see what I mean? It's going to go do the whole thing all over again. It's kind of a hammer because if you know that you only changed one section, okay, then you can call something like reload rows at index paths, and the index paths would tell the sections and rows, uh, with some animation. And the animations can be like uh, fade in or slide from the bottom or things like that. Um, so there are lighter weight ones you can call, and I'm actually going to show you in the demo, we're going to call one where uh, we're just going to tell the table view that we inserted a section, and it's going to immediately just ask me the data source message about that section and nothing else. Okay? So um, you do need to tell the table view every time you change your model. If you change your model in any way that would change the number of sections and rows, or even the display of a row, you need to tell the table view. So just always think about that when you're writing table view code. Change my model, tell the table view. Right away. You want to tell the table view right away. And change your model first, then tell your table view. Because when you tell your table view things have changed, it's going to go back and ask you self row index path, number of sections. It'll ask you those questions, some of them, uh, again. So make sure your model's already changed and ready to answer those questions. Let's talk about the height of rows. Okay? Um, the height of the row is generally set in the storyboard. Okay, so you, you can resize it and set it, and that's what it is. But you can also ask the delegate to, uh, you can also implement a method in the delegate, and it'll ask the delegate, what height should this row be? This might be very useful in your homework, by the way. Uh, but this is for when you have the rows that change height in some calculated way, okay? Maybe you have an image in there, and it's got different aspect ratios, for example, and so it's different heights sometimes, whatever. So you can answer it this way. Um, of course, the other way you can control the height is by doing auto layout and setting your height to be automatic dimension. If you set your height to be UI table view automatic dimension, that means go figure it out from the auto layout, please. Okay, so those are the three ways you can set the height. Set it fixed in the storyboard, answer this delegate method here, height for row and index path, or set it to be automatic dimension. If you do the automatic ways, then you also probably want to set the estimated row height. Okay, that just tells the table view, uh, yeah, calculate it from auto layout, but for all those cells, the 100,000 cells that aren't on screen, please don't do auto layout for 100,000 cells. Just estimate them to be about this. And as they start to come on screen, then it's going to do the auto layout and pick the exact right height. Okay? So that's why you need to estimate. And there's also a delegate method, estimated height for row at whatever. So there's dozens of methods also in table view itself, not in its delegates, but in table view itself. Uh, you can scroll to a row because it's a scroll view. It knows how to do scrolling. You can control the look, the separators between rows, all those kind of things. So you definitely want to familiarize yourself with the table view API itself. Don't forget about that. All right, so I'm not coming back to the slide, so just give you a quick coming up here. Uh, we have collection view on Friday. So collection view is very similar to table view, but the layout doesn't have to be in a strict table. It can be kind of laid out any way you want. But it's the same kind of thing where there's data and it's going to ask you how many sections there are and how many rows, or not rows, but items in that section. And then it's going to have this little extra mechanism for doing layout. So it's really awesome. Uh, I'd love to have time to teach it in lecture, not in the optional section, but you just got so much to teach in this course. And you really need to understand table view first, which is a little simpler before you can move on to collection view. But really don't miss on Friday. It's, it'll be a good way to really understand a much more powerful kind of data presentation. UI. And then next week we're going to um, talk about core data, which is the object-oriented database in iOS. Really powerful mechanism. Uh, right now I'm going to be doing a big de demo that shows how to do all this table view stuff and also text field and some other things. And your assignment four is out and it's due in one week on Wednesday. And it's basically to take what I do today and build a better one. Okay, more featureful. So that's why you always want to understand what I'm doing in lecture because I'm almost always just asking you to do the same thing. Okay, so I'm going to build a completely fresh app from scratch. Like I said before, it's going to be a Twitter client. We're going to be doing uh, Twitter searches. Um, it's going to be a single view app as always. I'm going to call it smash tag, okay, kind of like hashtag. This is going to be an iPhone only app, and that's true for your homework as well. Okay, iPhone only. We're not going to do an iPad thing. You already learned that with assignment three, trying to keep what you're learning, you know, as new as possible with each one. I'm going to put this where I always put everything. Here we go. 
It's our normal product. I'm going to get rid of some of these things over here that we don't really use very much. Actually, I'm going to leave plist as you'll see. It's a little new group. We'll do supporting files here. All right, we'll move that down. Now, I'm going to start by taking my storyboard here and just totally wiping it out. Okay, I'm just going to take the one controller that I got, the free one, and just delete it. I'm even going to go over to this code right here and delete that. Same thing I did in the last uh, demo, because I don't need any of that. I'm going to start uh, from scratch here. Uh, so we're building a table view app, so let's go grab a table view. I'm going to scroll down here. Here's a table view right here. I just drag it out. Now, this table view, if we want to use it as a delegate, uh, de delegate and data source, or if we want to have outlets to it, we of course need a subclass of it. So uh, let's go ahead and do that. New file. Okay, it's going to be a Cocoa Touch subclass, namely a UI table view controller. And I'm going to call this my tweet table view controller because it's going to show tweets. All right, and I'm going to be very careful to put it here, not at the top level of my project there. And here we go. Here's our code right here. I'm going to delete this uh, view controller lifecycle stuff as usual. But you'll notice the table view controller also has some extra stuff. Ooh, you recognize those methods? Number of sections, okay? Number of rows in section and self or row and index path. These are the key UI table view data source methods here. Okay, now there's some other UI table view data source methods here as well. Um, these are for things like deleting rows, moving rows. So when you're doing your uh, extra credit or when you're doing your final project, you'll be wanting to not delete those, but I will delete those just to make our code a little bit uh, cleaner here. Okay, so that's our UI table view controller subclass. We'll have to implement these in a second, but let's go back to our storyboard. We also obviously want to set our identity here to be, instead of being um, so if I can select this here, whoops, identity. Uh, instead of being just generic UI table view controller, we want it to be a tweet table view controller. Also, where's our arrow coming in? There's no arrow. So let's select it again and go back to attributes and pick is initial view controller. So we get this arrow coming in. Okay, otherwise when we launch our app, it's not going to know what MVC to start with. All right. Now, whenever we have a new MVC, what's one of the first things we always want to do? define its model, understand what this MVC is all about. What does it show uh, or do? And I'm going to pick my model to be a, an array of tweets. Okay, I'm going to call it tweets. But I'm actually going to make it be an array of array of tweets. Okay? Why am I making an array of array of tweets? Because I'm going to be able to put some tweets in my table, and then go fetch some more and put more in. And every time I put more in, I'm going to put it as a new section, okay, table view section. So each array on the inside of this array is another batch of tweets, and the outer array is all my sections. So I have a really nice data structure here. It really matches up nicely with table view. And it's kind of nice to have that kind of data structure, and I kind of recommend that in the homework. If you can make your data structure match up with sections and rows, then it makes the implementation of all these methods down here uh, a lot simpler. Um, all right, so I got that. I've got another part of my model, though, which is some search text. So the search text is like hashtag Stanford. That's what I want to search for. So this search text is what I'm searching for to find my tweets. And I'm going to make this one public. This is going to be a public part of my model. So anyone using my MVC, they set this search text, I will show those tweets. Okay, that's what I do. All right, and I'm going to do that by populating this part of my model over here um, to show them. So what do I need to do if the search text is set? So I, I need to do some did set here. This is a public model, so if someone sets it, I have to react well to it. I mean, one thing I'm going to want to do is remove all the tweets that are already in my table. And when I remove those from my model up here, I need to tell the table view about it. So I'm going to have the table view reload data, which is the hammer, which is okay because I removed everything. So the hammer is going to be pretty light, a little ball peen hammer, okay? Just going to clear the table out. So that's perfectly fine in this case. Uh, what else do I need to do? Well, I, now I need to search for tweets. So I have to write a function to do that, to search for some tweet. Um, I'm also going to set my title equal to the search text. That way, if I happen to be in a navigation controller or something like that, it'll show whatever I'm searching for, hashtag Stanford or whatever uh, at the top. So that'll just be kind of make my, my uh, UI look nice there. 
Uh, all right, so we've got to do this private func search for tweets. Okay, so this is the thing that needs to go off and find um, these tweets. And so we'll do that in a moment. One thing I'm also going to do is I'm going to do view did load just for testing purposes. You notice I do this a lot uh, when I'm developing and I want to have some testing. I'm going to just set my model to something. So we'll do hashtag Stanford. Okay, just, just for testing. Once we've got our MVC working, this public API is working, then we will remove this code. It's just testing code. Okay, now we have an error here. And this error is Swift saying, uh, excuse me, what is tweet? Okay, what is that type? And I didn't really want you to be wasting your time in your homework figuring out how to go fetch a tweet from Twitter and do a request and all that stuff. So I wrote a framework that did it for you. And by framework, I mean a framework like this, like UIKit, right? UIKit is this like library of a whole bunch of data structures that you can use to build your app. Well, I wrote one for you that will do Twitter stuff for it. And it has something in it called tweet, and it also has something called request that lets you make a Twitter request. All right, so that thing is right over here. Now, how do frameworks work? How do you use them when they're not built into the system like Apple? And the answer is you need to build a higher level structure for Xcode to work with called a workspace. So I'm actually gonna close this project Okay, I'm closing this project, and I'm going to Xcode, and I'm going to create a new thing, which you've never seen before, called a workspace. Now, when I create this workspace, it wants to know where to put it. Be careful here. Look, it's trying to put it inside my smash tag project, which I don't want to do that. I want to put it up at top of my developer level here, same place I put all my projects, okay? So really be careful about that. So I'm going to call this L9. This is Lecture 9, so we'll call it L9. And I hit save, and it's created this workspace. But notice in the navigator, there's nothing there. Okay. So what do we put in a workspace? Well, what we put in a workspace are other projects. And this workspace is just going to collect all those product projects because they kind of go together. And obviously, this Twitter framework that I'm providing to you right here goes together with smash tag, which is this thing we've been working on so far. Now, what you drag down in here is the Xcode proj, because it's the project itself that you want to put in this workspace. So you just drag that in for both of them. So I'm going to open this one as well. Here's the Xcode project for this Twitter thing. Drag in. Now, be careful not to put it inside. See how that's trying to put it inside, smash tag there? Put it outside so that they're siblings. Okay. Now I have this workspace right here that has two projects in it. I'm going to even go here and hide others. And if we look in the smash tag one, woo, looks familiar. This is the code we were just working on, right? If we look in the Twitter one, this is the code I'm providing you. Now, what's in here? Here's tweet, which is this struct, and it's got all the things you would expect in a tweet. The text of the tweet, the user who created it, which is another thing, user, right here, and the user has a screen name that's at sign something, uh, the actual name, a unique identifier for the user, um, back to tweet, it's also got a unique identifier. It's also got things that are embedded in the tweet, like other hashtags and other users that are referenced inside the tweet, and even media, because you know a lot of times tweets have an image with them too. Okay? And the other thing that's of importance in this Twitter frame that I'm giving you is this class request, Twitter request right here. Um, and this request class is the thing you use to make requests for Twitter. Now, I, you don't need to look at any of the implementation of any of this. And in fact, you can go and do assistant editor. And if you do assistant editor on something like this, you're actually going to see its public API here. See all those public, 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 public? Now, we have not seen uh, public, this public keyword before. All we've seen is private or not, or file private. So what does this public thing mean? Look, I put public in all these uh, things over here. Public means that not only is it not private, but you can see it even if this framework is being used by some other project. Okay, so public means public outside of this framework. Make, make sense? So in UIKit, a lot of things are marked public, all the things you can use. I have to be marked public because it's in a different framework than your app. Your app is kind of a framework uh, in a sense. Uh, so that's public. And then also notice farther down, these methods are marked internal. That means I can only use them inside my framework. So I can't call any of these methods from smash tag. They're internal. This actually, you haven't seen this keyword because 
it's the default. All the methods you've ever created that you didn't mark private or file private are internal. They just, it's the default so you haven't put the word internal there. Okay, so let's look at the public API. Let's not even pay any attention to that and look at the public API. This public API of request for making requests, we're only gonna use three things. One is this convenience initializer where you just give it something to search for and how many results you want. And then this method fetch tweets where you just give it this closure, which it will call when it's done. It's gonna go off and do it on another thread and when it's done it will call and that's going to have an array of the tweets it found that match your search. And then the last one we're gonna use is this one down here, newer, where if you ask a request, give me a newer request, it'll give you a request that you can use to get newer tweets. Okay, tweets that have been tweeted after the previous one that you got. So that's all we're gonna use here. We're not really gonna use any of the other API in this request. In your homework, you'll have to know this API here of tweet, because you'll have to be able to get the text and the user information, and also media items so you can get the URLs of images uh, that are in there, et cetera. Okay, so, but you never have to look at the private implementation of this framework, so don't even waste your time looking at there. Just look at things marked public. There's not a lot of things marked public. That's the only thing you're gonna look at for, look at. Okay, now, how do I use this framework, this Twitter framework, in Smash Tag? Well, you have to do one step. You can't just put them in the same work, workspace and start working. Well, it's two steps. One is, I need to say, import Twitter. Just like I say import UI kit, if I want to use this Twitter framework up here, I have to say import Twitter. That's going to cause this tweet to start being recognized as a type because it's going to see this tweet type right over here. Okay? But the other important thing, don't forget, is you need to tell Xcode that when you build Smash Tag, that app, include Twitter in it. And you do that by going to the Smash Tag project, okay, the project settings, and go all the way to the bottom where it says embedded binaries, and just pick up the product of your Twitter framework. You see it says products right here? Just pick that up and drag it in here. And that says, please put Twitter framework into my Smash Tag, because my Smash Tag uses it. If you don't do this step, then it'll all compile, but then when Smash Tag runs, Twitter won't be there, and so it will fail, okay? Now I'm gonna make you do that step as part of your homework. I will post this code for smash tag, but I'm not gonna post the workspace, or you're gonna have to build the workspace on your own, okay? All right, so let's continue. Now that we've got this array of tweets, uh, what are we gonna do with this array of tweets? Um, let's start by doing a fetch for our search text. We got our search text, we wanna go fetch all those things on there. That's what we're supposed to do in search for tweets. So I'm just gonna, well, let's make another function here, another little private funk. I'm gonna call it Twitter request, which is gonna return a Twitter dot request. Oh yeah, here's another thing. This I can call tweet because I'm importing this Twitter framework and there's no other class called tweet. So I just have to call it tweet. Its full name is actually Twitter dot tweet. Just like, you know, uh, UI table view controller, its full name is UIKit.UI table view controller. Now, I'm going to use Twitter.tweet because I think in assignment five, you might end up wanting to have your own local tweet class. So I'm going to use Twitter.tweet and Twitter.request everywhere, but I, I wouldn't have to as long as I didn't have a class called tweet or request otherwise. But this is a pretty generic name, request. So putting the Twitter dot on front hmm, might be a kind of a good idea anyway. All right, so. Uh, the Twitter request function here is just going to return a Twitter request that matches this search text. And that's really, really simple. I'm just going to say, if I can let the query for this search term equal the search text, and I want to make sure that that query is not empty. Okay, so I don't want to search for nil or for the empty string. So I'm just keeping that out of it right here. And otherwise, I'm just going to return a Twitter request using that convenient initializer I told you about called search. Okay, and I'm just gonna pass that query and uh, let's get 100 of them. Okay, so we're gonna, we'll grab 100 tweets at a time. Okay, and if that's not true, if the search term is nil or it's empty, then I'm gonna return nil from this. So let's make this be an optional. Okay, so everyone understand what this function does? It just makes a Twitter request that will search for our search text. That's all it does. So now down here in search for tweets, I can say if I can let request equal that Twitter request, which hopefully it can make, okay, 
Now I have a request. Uh, now I just need to uh, initial to cause that request to happen. So I'm just going to say um, this Twitter request fetch tweets. Okay. So this fetch tweets function right there, you see it, the top one. Okay. It takes this closure right here as an argument. I'm going to double click on it to show what it does here. I'm going to use trailing closure syntax and get rid of the parentheses there. Now, what's this? This is the only argument in my closure. Those are the tweets that it fetched. See, it's an array of tweets. I'll call this new tweets. Okay, so that's going to be array of tweets. I don't even need the parentheses here, by the way. So I have new tweets. So new tweets is going to be an array of tweet that it fetched. Now, of course, it's doing this off the main queue, right? It's got to go do that Twitter request. What if it's really slow network or Twitter is really slow that time or whatever? So inside here, I finally got these new tweets back. What do I want to do? Well, I just want to add them onto the end of my model, right? Here's my model. It's an array of array of tweets. Here's an array. So I'm just going to take my model and uh, append onto it this array of tweets. And actually, I'm not going to append it on the end because uh, I want all my new tweets to show up at the beginning. So in section zero at the beginning. So I'm going to insert these new tweets at zero in my array. Okay, so right at the top. So my new tweets are going to come in at the top. Make sense? Now, we have an error there. Can anyone guess why this error is here before I open it? What? Uh, mutating. That's a good guess, but no. It's because self. It's the old closure cycle problem, right? Since we're accessing self here, this tweets is part of our self, we need to explicitly say that so that we can notice, oh, we might have a memory cycle. And do we have a memory cycle here? In fact, we do. Because what if this view controller goes off to fetch some tweets and it takes forever, and so the person says, ah, I'll search for something else. And now they set the search text to something else, and another fetch goes off. And now here comes the first fetch, and it's irrelevant now because I already looked for something else. So we do here want to be careful to ignore this when it comes back. And we also, if someone searches and it's taken forever and they hit back, we want our view controllers to be able to leave memory as well. So we don't want the closure, the cycle here, we don't want these, this closure holding ourselves in memory. So we don't want this to be a strong pointer. And we need to check to make sure that when we get back, it's still what we're interested in. So how can we break the cycle? That's easy. We're just going to use our friend weak self. Okay. That turns this into an optional. So we have a question mark. Boom. We broke that cycle. So even if this fetch is sitting out there fetching, it's not going to be keeping our view controller in memory. Our view controller can leave mem memory. And if it comes back and it's gone, then this line of code will not execute. How about dealing with the fact that our request might have changed? Okay. Well, to do that, I'm going to have to keep track of our last Twitter request. Actually, we've got to put it inside here. Okay, I'm going to keep track of it. And then in here, um, I'm not going to do this unless uh, our request equals the last Twitter request. So if, the, if this request that came back is not the last one we issued, then I'm not going to do it. And so let me go up here and say pri whoops, private var last Twitter request, and that's going to be a twitter.request, of course. Request optional is not always said. Okay, everyone kind of see what I'm doing there? And of course, this is saying, oh, self again, so we'll put self in there. And of course, self is weak, so we'll do that. So that's all good. Any other problems you can see with this? I don't see any so far. Okay, so it's all good. So before we go hooking up our table view, let's just make sure that our Twitter fetches are working. And I'm going to do that by putting a did set up here on my model. And every time my model changes, I'm just going to print the tweets out. <laughs> okay. Now, luckily, I've made it so that tweet is custom string convertible. It implements description. It can print itself as a string. So this is an array of those. So this will print out an array, actually an array and over of an array of this tweet printed out as a string. So we're just going to uh, print it out there. Okay. Just seems like it should work. Let's go give it a try and find out. Um, we'll do this on iPhone 7. Okay, pay attention right now because this is not in fact going to work. 
and uh, this won't work for you either, and you're gonna need to do a couple of things to make a Twitter fetch work. You, by the way, you see we have this prototype table uh, cells have to have reuse identifiers. That, that we've got to remember to fix that later. All right, so we uh, run, and look at this thing it puts up here. Smash tag would like to access Twitter accounts. So you're not allowed to write an app that just starts posting things for people on Twitter behind the scenes, okay? When you write an app, it is always going to ask, the first time you try to use Twitter, whether it's allowed. So I'll click OK. And let's go look in our console and see if it printed. It didn't. All it printed out here is couldn't discover Twitter account type. Hmm, why would it say that? Well, that's because your simulator is just a device. It needs to have Twitter, a Twitter account. Basically, your device needs a Twitter account. So where do we set that? So let's go back to our simulator. Here it is. I'm gonna go hardware, home button. Okay, you can also do command shift F is hardware home button. And I'm gonna go over to the settings app on my simulator, but you could do it on your device as well. And if you go down in settings, here's Twitter. Look at that, Twitter right there. And here's where you type in your Twitter username and password. And if you don't type this in, then no apps on your system can access Twitter, okay? Because how would they? They have to know who you are. So I'm gonna type this here. I'm gonna do it off screen because I don't want you to see my password. Okay, so now I'm logged in on Twitter. Okay, and so now if I go back and start my app, it will both be in allowed because I clicked OK, and I'll be logged in, so it'll have an actual Twitter user that can do it. And sure enough, look down here at the bottom, we're getting all kinds of tweets being printed out here. Okay, so here's a tweet, here's its unique ID, here's the person who tweeted it, uh, here's when it was tweeted, here is the text of the tweet, it's got some, this one's got an embedded URL, etc. Okay, so we're doing well, we've got our tweets coming in. So now all we need to do is load them up into our table view. Okay, so what do we need to do to load this thing up in the table view? Well, it's surprisingly simple, actually. There are two pieces we have to do. One is every time we change our model, we have to tell the table view that it changed. And then we have to implement those table view data source methods. So let's start with the first one, okay? Here we changed our, actually we've already changed our model once, right here. We changed our model and we told the table view about it. So that's good. Here we're changing our model, so we need to tell the table view about it. So self.tableView. And what did I do here to my model? I just inserted a section at the beginning. So there happens to be a table view method called insert section, okay? And it just says, oh, you inserted some sections. Which ones? I'll go and ask you about those and put the rows in there for you. And this sections is an index set, which can be, you can give it an array literal. So I just inserted section zero. So I'll just put an array with just zero in it. And I'm gonna use the fade animation to show that fading in, okay? So insert section. So this is me telling the table view, I changed my model, so ask me again. Ask me those table view data source. Now since I told it exactly what I did, it's only going to ask me about that section, which is nice, higher performance. Then reload data, the hammer reload data, in which case it would ask me for all rows in all sections again. I'll be like, ugh, okay? So here I know exactly what I did. Now this actually is dangerous code here. This is really easy to add this line of code and now your app just acts weird. It just acts weird all the time. Can anyone want, guess why this, adding this line of code would cause my app to go all weird? It's because this is a UI call. And what queue are we on here? Some queue, not the main queue. Whatever queue we fetch those tweets on, okay? So we're not on the main queue. So we can't make a UI call here, all right? So we have to dispatch this back to the main queue. So this is something that will just take some getting used to for you guys with this multi-threading, is you're gonna do these things on this other queue and you're gonna update your table view and then oh, it's like, what's going on? My app is just acting so strange. Uh, and that's why, because you can only do UI stuff on the main queue and it's not gonna warn you or necessarily crash, it might eventually crash, it's just gonna act all weird, okay? So, fix that. This is good, we've got the table view updating our model and we've got the table view knowing about change to the model. So now all I need to do is update this, implement this UI table view data source protocol so that it can 
get the data from us. So let's do it. Number of sections. How many sections are in our table? Anyone want to know? Yeah? Exactly. Candy thrown at you, because that's exactly right. Tweets dot count. It's just the number of arrays that we have in our model here, because each of these arrays inside here are a section, so perfect. And then what about this one? Here we're being asked how many rows are there in the tweets subsection, and that's just count also. Okay? So we've designed our data structure so that these are super easy to implement, which I highly recommend if you can do it. You can't always do it, but can, it's nice. So now a little more difficult, only a little though, is self row and index path right here. Okay, so here's where we have to return the UI table view cell that we're going to, that it's going to use to draw. Now let's go back to our storyboard here and we're going to, let's just start out with something simple. Let, let's try using here a subtitle cell. So I'm going to click on this cell and I'm going to change its style from being custom to being subtitle. So it has title and subtitle. And I'm going to set the title to be the text of the tweet, and I'm going to set the subtitle to be the person who tweeted it. Okay? So let's try it and see, see how that looks. So how am I going to do that? Two things I need to do here. One is I need to dequeue a reusable cell, and I need to tell iOS which prototype to use. Which prototype in the storyboard. So let's go back to our storyboard. Okay, and I only have one prototype, it's this one, that's the one I want to use. So I need to give it an identifier, I'm going to call it tweet, because that's what this shell cell shows, it shows a tweet. Notice that caused my warning to go away, because all these prototype cells always need an identifier. And now when I go back here, I can change this from reuse identifier to tweet. Okay, so now I'm able to dequeue a reusable cell that will be a copy of that prototype, that subtitle. So all my rows are going to be subtitle rows. So now I've got this cell. It's of type UI table view cell, by the way, since it's a standard type, not a custom type. How do I configure it? Well, for me to configure the cell to set the title and the subtitle, I need to know which tweet it's asking me for here. And I know which tweet it's asking because it's saying cell for row at. This is the row that's the tweet that it's asking me to give it a UI table view for, table view cell for. So I'm going to let tweet equal my model sub index path dot section and index index path dot row. So I'm just getting this row in this section. This gets the first array, the array this is the section. Now I'm just getting the row out of it. So now I've got the tweet. So now I can just update the cell really easily. Cell dot uh, text, what's it called? Text label, yeah. Uh, might be an optional dot text equals, let's have that be the tweets text. Okay, this is something that you'll see in here. We go to the Twitter and look at the Twitter framework at tweet, and you'll see that the very first one, in fact, is text. And then we'll make the cell detail text label. Its text will be the tweets user's name, let's say. Okay, so again, tweet user user name. Okay, so that's how I'm getting that information. Everyone understand that part of it? Okay, so that all came out of this tweet. This is of type tweet. Okay, everybody got that? All right, so is that it? Is that, do we need to do anything else to hook this thing up and make it work? Turns out, no. Okay, so let's just run. Okay, there it is. The world's greatest Twitter client. Look at that, it looks beautiful. No, of course, the fact this is the world's ugliest Twitter client right here, but it is working. These are tweets. Uh, but anyway, you can see here's the uh, tweets and here are the, um, uh, the person who tweeted it. Okay, now, obviously this is awful UI. Just absolutely horrendous UI. You would never have a Twitter client like this. We want our UI in these cells to look much nicer, much more customized to a tweet. So we're going to go back to our storyboard here, and instead of using this awful subtitle style cell, we're going to build a custom cell. And this custom cell is going to have more good looking uh, and more of the data that comes with a tweet. So 
let's just build it. Let's go here, make this a little bigger, make some room. All right, I'm gonna grab some labels out of here. Here's a label. This will maybe be, let's say this is the tweeter. This is the person who, who's doing the tweet. By the way, this is a case where we're showing user content, really. These tweets are content. They're not like the title of a button or something. It's actually the content that the user has requested to see. So I'm going to use a font here. You see this font? I'm not going to use the system font. I'm going to go down and start using these text styles. So the tweeter is going to kind of be at the top. I'm going to have that be a headline font. So this is going to be the headline font. This could change over time, okay? Just whatever the system thinks headline font is. And it'll be true in every app. A headline will always you be using this font in every app. And users can even go into settings and change the size of their fonts. If they're like me and their vision's going, they can set them bigger, okay? And the fonts will get bigger automatically. So there's a big advantage to using these uh, fonts, these font styles. So there's that one. Um, there is the text of the tweet itself, so we'll just call that text. Uh, for this one, maybe a good font is body font, because this is really, this is the heart of what we're doing here, this body thing. One thing that's kind of cool with UI label, you know, the text in the tweet is probably going to be multiple lines, and it's going to wrap. When you have a UI label like that, you want to set this property lines to be zero. Okay, if you have zero predefined lines, then the UI label will be, well, will be however many lines it needs to to fit the information with wrapping, okay? Whereas this one is line one. This is always going to be one line. And if it's too long, it just gets dot, dot, dot at the end. All right. Uh, what else do I want to do here? Let's do, uh, let's do another label here for when the tweet was tweeted out, when it was created. That one's probably something like a caption, we'll say. Small little text at the bottom. We'll uh, go ahead and center that right there. Uh, let's also get an image. Let's go down and find an image view down here. Where's our image view? Here it is. Drag it out here. This is going to be uh, the profile image of the tweeter. So whoever tweeted this will have their little image here. Um, this one, by the way, I don't know how big profile images are on Twitter, and I don't care because I'm going to make this thing always be a fixed size. So how do we make an image like this be a fixed size? Uh, using auto layout. And it turns out what you do is you control drag to itself. And when you do, you'll see that you have the option to fix its width, and you can control drag, and fix its height. You could also do both at the same time. And so what width and height has it fixed it to? Well, we can look over here in the size inspector and see that it's fixed it to 71 by 67. That doesn't sound very computer science-y. I'm going to fix it to 64 by 64. So I've made it so this image view is always going to be 64 by 64. I don't care how big the person's actual profile image is. I always want it to be that way. Okay, so there's another little auto layout tidbit for you. All right, so speaking of auto layout, I need to lay this stuff out. I kind of want it to look, yeah, something like this. See what I mean? Approximately. And so I'm just going to use stack views. So we'll stack those two things together like that. Look at our things here. Fill and fill. That's perfectly fine. Uh, let's go over here, let's stack those together. Uh, that's fill and fill. One thing about these two, by the way, uh, they're going to be sharing the space in this, ta in this stack view equally, okay? Um, but I don't want them sharing equally. <laughs> I actually want the text to get more of the space. So I'm going to click on the tweeter, and I'm going to go over to the size inspector, and I'm going to do something cool, which is set its content hugging priority. I'm going to set its vertical contact hunting priority to be higher than the other one. So they're both 251. You see, that one's 251, that one's 251. So I'm going to set this one to be 300, just anything higher than 251. And that means that when the space is being allocated between this tweeter and the text, it's going to hug the tweeter's content, and the text is going to get all the rest. Okay? So that's a way that you can kind of, when you're sharing space between two things. All right, so now let's put these two in a stack. Maybe we'll uh, put some spacing here, something like that. Um, alignment here, top is good. I want them both at the top. I think that's good, I'm lined up uh, at the top. Uh, so I like that, and fill is fine. Uh, I've got this. Now I'm going to do the same thing we did before, which is I'm going to put this in the corner, and I'm going to control drag to the top. I'm going to control drag to the leading edge. I'm going to control drag to the trailing edge, and I'm going to control drag to the bottom edge, okay? So I want that out there, and again, the same thing. I'm going to take this, 
and change it to standard if I can. I can't, so we'll go zero. And same thing here. Standard if I can. I can't, we'll do zero. Okay? So I've made this stack view that contains all this stuff fit in there. So I've basically done the auto layout necessary to make this thing use the space properly. Okay? And I can still change the size of this cell, right? I can click on it and I can make it a little bit smaller. And all that stuff is just going to you know, stick to the edges, so it'll all be fine. Now, this is great. In fact, if we go back to our table view controller, and if I comment out this cell configuration, because we don't have a subtitle, so these don't make any sense anymore, uh, and we run, then we're going to see that our UI, hopefully, if we didn't forget anything, it's going to look, in some ways, a little better. Yeah, so it kind of looks better. Now, the only thing that's not better is we lost our data because I commented out the data loading right here. So this is what we want the UI to look like, basically, with an image here and that there. But we need to set all this data. So how do we do that? Well, since this is a custom cell over here, we need to do it with a custom subclass of this UI table view cell right here. So I'm going to create one of those. New file. Sorry, let me stop. Let's go here and new file. Okay, again, it's a Cocoa Touch class. This time, though, it's not a table view controller, it's a table view cell. Okay, and I'm going to call it a tweet table view cell because it shows a tweet. Put it in the same place as all the rest of my stuff there. Here's my table view cell. It gives me awake from nib, which is kind of nice, don't need it. Uh, and set selected. I don't do anything special when my table view cell is selected, but I could. I could draw in a blue background or something like that if I wanted, but I don't. Um, so I have this table view cell subclass. I'm going to go back to my storyboard and make sure that I set the identity. Don't forget this step. Set the identity to be a tweet table view cell. If you forget this step, you won't be able to do any outlets or anything like that. Okay. Now I want to wire outlets up to this new class I just created. So I need to get them both on screen. I'll show you kind of a cool way to do that. Let's get the assistant editor up here. Remember, I could do manual, blah, blah, blah. But another way is to hold down the option key and just click on the thing that you want to be on the right. I think I showed this before. But option clicking in the navigator will put that thing on the right. All right, so let's move this over more. Some space there. All right, so I need to wire up outlets to these four things, right? The tweeter, the text, and the image. So let's just do that. We'll go here, control drag, crane out. I'll call this my tweet, uh, what did I call this? My tweet profile image view. Profile image view, because it's going to be a UI image view that shows the tweeter's profile. Uh, let's do the little create down here. Control drag from that. We'll call that tweet uh, created label. It's a label that shows when it was created. Let's do our little tweeter right here. And we'll call that our tweet user label. It's going to show the label of the tweet user. And then we have the text right here. It's going to show the actual tweet text, tweet text label. OK, so I got these nice uh, little outlets right here. Now, of course, I need to be able to set these outlets with something. And here's where I need public API in my table view cell that gives me the data I need to do that. And I'm just going to have my public API here be tweet. Give me the twitter.tweet that you want, and I'll load these babies up. OK, that's what it's saying here. Of course, we need to import Twitter, because we're using it in this class. OK, and when you set this tweet, I'm just going to, on did set, update my UI, just like I was a controller. But I'm not. I'm not a controller. I'm a view, actually. This is the only time a view can have uh, these outlets, OK? So I need some private func to do that. Update UI. OK, now, you know, time is running a little bit short here. So I'm just going to type this in real quick. Uh, I believe I have tweet cell. Oh, there it is, OK? Uh, so this is update. You can look at this later, but I'm just basically setting all the outlets here. See how I'm just setting these outlets, like setting the tweet level text to be the tweet's text, setting the user label to be the user description. Um, notice, by the way, I'm blocking the main thread here. Ugh. Okay, if this was my homework, bam, I just got dinged. So make sure you fix this, okay? If you're going to use my code in any way in your homework, uh, which you probably want to, then you're going to want to fix this. Okay, don't do this on the main thread. Don't block the main thread. 
But does anyone understand what Update UI is doing here? It's just taking this tweet that I was giving and loading this up. And this is happening over and over for every row in the table that gets displayed. This is happening. The copy of this class is being made, and this is happening. Now, how do we set this? Okay, we set this back over here in our tweet table view controller in the same place that we configured the cell here for the uh, subtitle one. And in fact, I still need the tweet, but I don't need that. I'll leave those there so you can remember that code when you look at it later. But instead of setting those things, I just want to set that tweet. I want to set this var right here. But for me to set the var right here, I need to get my table view to be one of these. So I need to use an as. So I'm going to say, if I can let the tweet cell equal the cell, this reusable cell that I got, as a tweet table view cell, then I can say, cell, set your tweet to be my tweet that goes at this row, section and row. OK? Now, we set the, uh, uh, what, oh, sorry, tweet cell dot tweet. We set the class of, these, of this prototype right here, the prototype for this cell. We set it with the identity inspector to be a tweet table view cell. So when we come in here, it will, in fact, this as will work. Okay, it will be a tweet table view cell because we said that in the storyboard. So it created that kind of uh, thing. All right, so let's see if this works. Okay, it is working. Look, we've got the time the person tweeted it. It's got the person who tweeted it. It's got the text of the tweeting, but we got no image. Why didn't we get uh, people's images here? Okay, why do you think we didn't get these, these images? Well, let's go look at our console. What does it say? Oh, no, app transport security. You recognize that from last time? It's because these profiles are HTTP slash something, not HTTPS slash something. So we know how to fix that. We'll just go back to our P info P list right here and add a row for app transport security. We'll open that up. We'll add arbitrary loads here. We'll make that be, yes, we allow arbitrary road, loads. OK, there's another problem here, though. Look at all these tweets. Look how they're cut off. You see, every row is the same size, and it's not big enough for most of the tweets. It's just dot, 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 dot. Wouldn't it be cool if these rows could be different sizes depending on how big the tweet is? Well, of course we can do that. Let's do it. Let's go see how this size is being set right now. Right now, it's being set if we go and inspect this cell in its size inspector, look, the row height is 96. So every single row is 96. What we want to do is in our view did load right here, we want to say that our table view's row height is not 96, it's UI table view automatic dimension. But as I said before, we also want to give it a little help by setting its estimated row height to something. And I'll tell you what, let's set it to what's in the storyboard. Table view dot row height. Okay, so I'm getting the row height out of the storyboard, using it as the estimate, and then I'm resetting the row height to be the automatic dimension. And sure enough, see, look, this tall tweet is getting extra space, and some of the smaller tweets, I don't know if we have any, here we can probably see it if we go like this. The smaller tweets get less space. Okay, so that's good. Um, we're out of time, so if you have to go, feel free. Uh, the last thing I'm going to do here in a little overtime is add a text field at the top that lets us type in what we want to search for instead of always looking for Stanford. So we're going to get Stanford out of there. Okay, so how do we do that? It's real easy. We have, if you remember the table view, it's got this little header view at the top. So I'm just going to take a UI text field. Remember this editable text field we learned about in the last lecture. I'm going to put it on the top. It's a little hard sometimes to see where it's going, but when it looks like this, the width of the table, then you've got it. It's dropping it in there. It's also a little hard to select and click on, so you're going to want to use that control shift click, and that way you can pick either the controller, the table view, or in this case, the text field. Um, I'm going to inspect it and change it a little bit. I'm just going to make the font a little bit bigger. We'll say 22. Now, notice I can also set all those text field things I was talking about. Like, I don't want it auto-correcting. I don't want to say, search for hashtag, hashtag Super Bowl and change it to hashtag Super Space Bowl. Okay, so I don't want any correction going on. Keyboard type, 
Ooh, look, there's a Twitter keyboard type. It's probably got hashtag and at time, things like that. Uh, the return key, that's just the key on the thing that says return. Uh, I'm searching here, so I want it to say search. So that just means the return key is going to say on it search. Um, also, a little clear button would be cool, cool, a button you can press to clear out uh, what's going on. So you can kind of configure this in any way you want uh, to make it work in there. Now, normally I would run this and show you that it's there, but of course, let's wire it up first so it actually does something. It's real easy to wire up a text field. You just want to hook it up to an outlet and set its delegate, and then you can find out when the return key is pressed. So let's do that. We'll go here. Let's get our tweet table view controller on screen at the same time. We just want to create an outlet to that thing. I'll put it uh, right in here. So I'm just, uh, again, I would probably want to shift click to select it. All right, oops, picked the wrong one. So let's just click, collect this, <laughs> select this, and control drag from it. And see it's a UI text field. And I'm going to call this my search text field. Simple as that. When it's set, I'm going to set my, myself as its delegate. Search text field dot delegate equals self. Of course, for me to be its delegate, I have to go up here and say, yes, I am a UI text field delegate. Okay, there, all the methods are optional in there, so I have now successfully implemented that protocol. Um, oh, what happened here? Uh, yes, okay. So that's, so I've set the delegate. Now I'm going to implement the delegate method I want, which is that should return. It gets sent to me when the return button is sent. So that is text field. Notice as I type text field, it shows me them all, and it's this one right here. Text field should return. Let me make this bigger bigger so you can see it better. Okay, so here should return. Uh, if I get return, I'm actually going to check to make sure I'm getting this from my search text field because someday I might have other text fields and I want to make sure I'm getting, I know which one I'm talking about. So text field is this argument right here and I'm just checking to make sure it's me. And if that is true, then I'm just going to set my search text equal to the search text fields text. Okay. Make sense? And when I set my search text, that's immediately going to start it going. Notice that should return also returns a bool, which is whether to do what it normally does when return is pressed, which in this case is nothing because we don't have any target action or anything else, but we'll return true. Sure, do what you normally do. Now, the only other thing here is now that we have the search text field up here, when we set our search text, we want to update our search text field. And I'll be careful here in case I'm doing it in prepare. We'll set it to uh, the search text that we just set it to. Also, I'm going to have my search text field resign first responder here. That's if somebody types something and hits go search, and we, we search for something and put it in there, I'm going to take the keyboard away, because I just don't want to have the keyboard blocking the results that they just asked for. Also, if someone sets it in code, I'm going to get rid of the keyboard, even though someone might be in the middle of typing, but if someone sets it in code while they're typing, let's get that keyboard uh, out of the way. All right, so let's go do that. Leave this code on the screen so you can see it. That. All right, so here is our uh, text field. It's kind of hard to see under this carrier. We'll fix that in a second. Uh, let's go ahead and search for hashtag Stanford again. Oh, whoops, I'm not going to do this. Watch this. Okay, that looked easy to type, didn't it? Well, let's go here and say keyboard, turn off the hardware keyboard. Now, when we click in here, oh, it's a lot harder to type. Hashtag Stanford. Okay, so now you're getting the, to what I'm saying about learn to type like your users will be. And so here I'm going to search. Goes in Stanford and searches for it. Let's go search for something else here. Um, maybe we'll search for, this is kind of dangerous because the people might say, but Trump. Okay, there's some Trump uh, ones. Okay, now we've done all this. I want to fix this thing though where this looks really bad uh, at the top here and there's a really easy fix to that, which is I'm just going to, this is the fix, the fix is everything in the UI as you've learned. I'm just going to embed this in a navigation controller. Okay, when you embed this in a navigation controller and run, you're going to see it makes a nice title at the top. It moves the text field down. Uh, it's just much nicer all the way around. Okay, see how it's done that, it's moved it, it down here. 
Um, one other thing I'm going to do is put a placeholder text in there. I meant to show you that. Sorry, let's do that. If I go back to here, click this thing in here, select this guy. You can put a placeholder text like this, Twitter search, and see it shows it in there, kind of in light gray, so that when you run, it's more obvious to the user what is that big white space, right? Be clear to them that it's a Twitter searching thing here. You know all you need to know to do your homework. Good luck with it. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.